Good morning, everyone. Um, if you are not from the East Side in the US right now, so probably good, good evening uh, or, you know, we could have uh, all kinds of time zones these days. So we're, my name is Wei Sun Shi, the Associate Dean for uh, Research and Graduate Studies. I'm very happy to uh, host today's speaker, which is one of our uh, Global Engineering Education Adjust up seminar series uh, this summer. This is the first time we have been starting doing this, and 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 uh, but it's very helpful, particularly during the pandemic. So the idea of this whole seminar series is trying to, uh, you know, show you that some the research and the R&D activities at Wayne State by our star faculty members. As you probably see that this is already the sixth around this um, in the series. And uh, we basically cover all the eight departments, the research, and etc. So, uh, today's talk that will be related to biomedical uh, from biomedical engineering. Dr. Muhammad Muhammad is going to give the talk. And before that, I want to have a very brief, you know, introduction about uh, Dr. Muhammad. That you know, he actually is a very rich. Uh, have a very rich experience, not rich in money, as hopefully will be there soon. But what I say is they have a very rich experience sitting, although sitting in the engineering, he's currently a social professor at the, in the BME department at the Wayne State. Uh, Wayne State uh, Biomedical Engineering is uh, one of the earliest in the nationwide. It's a very, uh, you know, uh, he probably will be share us more about the history of the department. And in addition to that, he also holds the, uh, I think, a clinical or uh, what do you call, normally what do you call it, um, a point, a research clinical faculty at the OBGYN at the School of Medicine. So before that, he was working at the Mayo Clinic as a research scientist at the Rochester, Minnesota. So if you guys pay attention to this, uh, the world rankings of the of the best, uh, the hospitals and etc. Mayo Clinic, I think, is ranked by number one in the world. And put, so he had a chance to work in there uh, before joining Wayne State as a faculty. He started getting his bachelor degree from Sharif, uh, Sharif, you know, Institute of Technology in Tehran. And uh, that was uh, one of the best, I would say, in terms of engineering, is the best in Iran, uh, Iran, right? So then uh, he got his master's degree at uh, IIT, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology and then getting his PhD from UT Austin. So that was uh, pretty uh, about his, uh, you know, uh, education background. And then since he joined the Wayne State, you know, I would say that uh, Muhammad is definitely, a, uh, you know, a rising star faculty at, uh, at the Wayne State. He has got, a, you know, enormous award at uh, Wayne State, you know, including uh, teaching, uh, t excellence of teaching award, a research award, and, um, also, you know, very well funded by a national science, uh, sorry, National Institute of Health, NIH, including leading a couple of RO1, uh, those are big grants. And uh, he's also actively collaborating with the medical school, uh, Detroit Medical Center and et cetera. So without uh, further ado, I will turn the podium to uh, Dr. Mahamudi. Uh, go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Shi, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Well, good morning uh, uh, in the Eastern time. Uh, 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 my talk is actually going to be about, um, it's, it's going to be about um, uh, talking a little bit more about, uh, talking a little bit about ultrasound, but not traditional ultrasound. So I'll start talking about what ultrasound is, but then quickly after that, I'll switch to recent advancements in ultrasound uh, uh, to basically open up new opportunities for sonography. So the title is Ultrasound Elastography and Podacoustic Imaging for Characterization of Tissue Biomechanics, Function and Molecular Composition. And I basically have a little bit more uh, uh, material to present here, um, including combination of therapy and uh, diagnostic into a single device. So um, before I start um, um, a little bit about Wayne State uh, College of Engineering, and of course, um, uh, uh, I got these slides from, from the college. 
Uh, I joined Wayne State in 2014, uh, a very good opportunity. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you at the end about the possibility of collaboration with the medical school, which is one of the greatest things we have here. Uh, um, uh, but briefly talking about the college, the College of Engineering has already more than 30,000 alumni uh, out of uh, the whole uh, 274,000 alumni from the Wayne State University. It's located in the uh, uh, downtown um, of, of the city of Detroit. It's probably one of the uh, 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 few uh, active research institutes that are located in the metro area, in the downtown area. And we basically have very active engineering program um, at Wayne State. Uh, we have different departments. I work in biomedical engineering department. As Dr. She mentioned, I also have a secondary appointment in the School of Medicine, but uh, we basically um, have the College of Engineering ranked in the top 100 uh, graduate programs. And BME program is actually one of the uh, earliest ones uh, that was formed in the nation. Uh, so I think the history of the biomedical engineering department goes to probably uh, 30 years ago where many schools didn't have the biomedical engineering program. Wayne State was one of the first ones that started the biomedical engineering pro program, branched out from the biomechanics. So the mission of the department is to enhance biomedical engineering education and more importantly, research uh, to enable graduates to attack basically real world problems. Um, in a specific, we have uh, programs in biomechanics, bioinstrumentation and imaging and biomaterials for undergraduates and for graduate program basically have more specialties. We have injury biomechanics, we have tissue engineering and biomaterials, we have instrumentation, imaging, and computational biology. And I think over the past uh, couple of years that I have been with Wayne State, uh, we actually have been actively trying to uh, step into more areas of research, more active area of, of research. The department is well funded. We had over $11 million of funding from National Institute of Health and Department of Defense uh, over the past five years. So we are uh, very active in research. And of course, this cannot happen without having very good students and very good, uh, uh, basically, staff. All right, so the way that I... Uh, uh, prepared this presentation is that I will have an introduction and then I will basically I'm going to so the first big part of the uh, presentation is going to be general talking about the techniques talking about the modalities and the diagnostic tools that I will basically tell you about the specific application in my research but at the beginning I'll basically introduce them as a general tool and then I'll talk about the uh, projects that we do in the lab at the end. Um, and of course, uh, we do uh, five or six major projects in the lab. And I'm going to talk mostly about two of them in details, and I will briefly talk about the others. So after the introduction, I'll talk about the ultrasound-based molecular theranostic and the word theranostic. You will hear it in this presentation. It's basically the combination of diagnostic and therapy. Um, basically the devices, the tools uh, that we have in clinic, or we are trying to make it uh, to clinic that can do both jobs. They can do treatment and then they can do imaging. And then I will uh, basically talk about ultrasound elasticity imaging, which is a very active area of research. Um, it's already in clinic for a lot of applications. And then I'll tell you about the projects that we do uh, in the lab or we have done in the lab in the past and we are doing now. So most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today are relevant to ultrasound and so, or, or, or uh, uh, some of you know it as sonography. So sonography is a very important imaging modality in clinic. It basically, it's, it's basically, uh, 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 it can be found everywhere in clinic. We have applications from, um, cardiology uh, to ophthalmology. Sorry, let me see if the animation works. Um, 
All right. Well, the animation doesn't work, but um, we basically are using ultrasound um, in pretty much all the clinical departments, cardiology, neonatology, um, of course, OBGYN. It's being used a lot in emergency room. Um, it's being used for assessment of the bone health. It's being used for assessment of the liver, kidneys, pretty much any, any abnormality that you can um, imagine or any disease you can imagine, uh, ultrasound is there to, um, to help. More specifically or more importantly, because ultrasound is a very safe imaging modality, we use it a lot for um, uh, vulnerable patients. And the most vulnerable patients are basically fetus and the neonate. So when we talk about the neonatology, when we talk about the uh, imaging fetus, ultrasound is basically the most suitable modality to perform the diagnostic. So if you think about the healthcare system, uh, or if you uh, want to compare the presence of different imaging modalities in the clinical system, or ultrasound is by far the most widely used diagnostic modality. And when we talk about that, uh, it, it means that you go to any clinic, you go to small clinic, very well equipped uh, hospital facility, you will find ultrasound imaging uh, machines there. There is a chance that you go to a rural region, smaller clinics, and you cannot find MRI, you cannot find PET, or you cannot find X-ray. Well, X-ray is almost uh, as widely used as ultrasound too, but MRI and PET are not. But ultrasound is pretty much everywhere. The reason is that it's a non-ionizing modality, so it's very safe. So in contrast to X-ray and PET or nuclear medicine, ultrasound it does not ionize the body. It's very safe for the body. There is no risk to the patients who are using ultrasound. It provides real-time images. That's in contrast to MRI. That's not real-time. So you basically turn on the ultrasound machine. You put the probe on the patient and you see what is going on in the body. It has a very large um, scalable penetration depth that is in contrast to optical imaging, which you mostly are able to see the surface or if you go deeper inside the tissue, you lose the accuracy and the resolution. But the most important thing about the ultrasound is that it is portable. So I'm pretty sure that you guys have been into clinics and you have seen people are rolling carts and those carts are ultrasound machines. They're taking them from one department to another department, from a patient room to another patient room, from a scan room to another scan room. So it's, it's very compact portable uh, imaging modality. And another factor that makes it very widely available is the cost effectiveness. So when we talk about the cost effectiveness, I'm showing to you a typical price. And of course, these are the numbers from 2010, but everything is scaling up and down almost uh, the, uh, with, with the same trend with the advancement of the technology. Maybe some of the prices go, go lower. Maybe we make some imaging modalities more advanced, but pretty much all of them are moving up and down together. So in 2010, a typical pr a price for a typical ultrasound unit was a, around $70,000. And you can compare it with X-ray, $280,000. CT is more expensive, MRI, and PET. So you can see that ultrasound is able to provide really nice images at a very good price. And that basically makes ultrasound very popular. All right. All right. So, so everything I told you so far uh, uh, was an advertisement for ultrasound. But what are the limitations of the ultrasound or traditional ultrasound imaging or traditional sonography? So ultrasound or sonography, B-mode sonography images has been used mostly for imaging or diagnosis of abnormalities in a structure or morphology of the tissue. So when we talk about the grayscale ultrasound images, when we talk about the grayscale sonography images, we basically are looking to see some abnormalities in the structure and the, 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 the shape or, or the geometry of the tissue. 
what is uh, the requirement for accurate diagnosis in today's medicine? We are actually uh, after more information than what we can see in a structure. We are basically trying to see whether the tissue is functioning well, or we are after doing the functional imaging. And a more recent area of diagnostic is that we are trying to basically do diagnostic at the cellular and molecular level. So an example of that is that we want to basically do imaging and diagnostic at a much smaller scale. When we talk about cancer, for example, we don't want the patient to come to clinic with a three centimeter mess, uh, 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 with a three centimeter uh, lesion or mass in the breast, in the, in the prostate, in the kidneys. We want to basically image at much smaller scale increase the diagnostic um, accuracy, do early stage detection, and that makes the treatment much easier and uh, reduces the mortality. So unfortunately, ultrasound traditionally is, has, been, has not been used for uh, 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 functional and molecular imaging. Well, we have some sort of functional imaging for ultrasound. Those of you who are familiar, we can measure the blood flow very accurately with ultrasound and blood flow is functional information. It can tell you, for example, how the heart is functioning, how the kidneys, how the liver is functioning. But we are basically after getting more functional information that I will tell you about it in this presentation. So the goal of advanced ultrasound research is to expand the scope of the traditional ultrasound by providing the opportunity to look into biological events at smaller scale, for example, at cellular and molecular level. And that's the area that we call it ultrasound-based molecular imaging and therapy. And then another active area of research in ultrasound is to explore new abilities of ultrasound imaging. What else we can get from the ultrasound images? What other information we can get from ultrasound images? So, in that domain, people are looking into quantitative ultrasound. So not just looking at the structure that we can visualize with ultrasound, but let's go deeper into the signal that we are receiving, do advanced signal and image processing and see whether we can quantify these signals that we are receiving by our ultrasound scanner and we can get more information from the tissue. That's an area that's called quantitative ultrasound. Another area or another type of information that we can get from our ultrasound scanner is information about the mechanical properties or stiffness or softness of the tissue, which is a very important diagnostic information. And that is basically the field that we call it ultrasound-based tissue elastography. And I will talk about the ultrasound-based tissue elastography in this presentation. So let's start with, ultrasound-based cellular and molecular, molecular theranostic. So the goal is that we want to spatially localize and temporally resolve sensing or imaging events at cellular and molecular level, right? So imagine that you want to put an ultrasound probe on somebody's body, and then you basically distinguish between, for example, cancer cells and normal cells not talking about a one centimeter tumor, I'm talking about really distinguishing between normal cells and um, uh, cancer cells or disease cells. So what do we do if, uh, in, 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 in clinic or what, what is the routine procedure to do this? Well, we take samples, that's called biopsy procedure. You take sample from the area that you're suspicious that there must be or there could be cancer cells. And then you take it to a lab, you mount it on a microscope slide, you put it on a very, very strong microscope and you look at the cells and you will see an image like this. So this image will tell you that, for example, I have normal cells shown in yellow and I have cancer cells that are shown in uh, white. So the question is, are we able to do such high resolution imaging with ultrasound imaging? Well, the answer is no. Of course, we will not be able to do that. When we talk about ultrasound imaging, we are talking about the resolution of couple of hundred microns. So when we talk about resolution of 
a couple of hundred microns, it means that there is no way that you can see an image that I'm having on a screen right now. You will not be able to see the cells. So what does that tell you? It tells that ultrasound is by itself is limited to distinguish between abnormal and normal cells. So in the field of imaging, for those of you who are familiar, Imaging is all about finding the contrast. So you're looking at this image on, on my screen. What you can see is a contrast between the normal cells and the cancer cells. So when we, when we talk about ultrasound is not being able to provide this image for me, it means that ultrasound does not have contrast, does not have enough contrast to tell me that there are cancer cells and there are normal cells or differentiate or provide some sort of different signature in my ultrasound images to differentiate between these images. So as any other imaging modality, when we are dealing with the lack of contrast, we always use contrast agents. And contrast agents in the field of imaging means that you basically use external agents to inject to the body and you generate the contrast that you want to see in your images. For example, in magnetic resonance imaging, we use magnetic particles. They go, they basically tag or uh, label the tissue of interest or the disease tissue. You put the patient in MRI scanner and you easily see where those particles are accumulated or where those particles are labeled the tissue. And that is your disease tissue. We do the same thing for X-ray. We do the same thing for CT. And of course, the nuclear medicine is all about contrast imaging. So, this is basically the uh, cellular and molecular imaging uh, theme. So you have a diseased region, um, in this case, for example, a lesion in liver, you inject some contrast agents to the patient body. It goes through bloodstream with some chemistry, special chemistry that you do with these particles, you make them um, uh, 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 suitable labels for the cancer cells. In other words, they go accumulate in the cancer site or in the disease site. And then when they accumulate and the rest of the particles, free particles are washed out from the body or they accumulated or they, they basically um, are not in the bloodstream anymore, you put the patient in your imaging device and then you find where these particles are, accumula uh, are accumulated. This is basically doing imaging at cellular and molecular level. So what do we have in today's medicine? So uh, I'm showing to you what we have in preclinic and what we have clinic in, in clinic. So in preclinic, we have, uh, um, 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 of course, ultrasound. We have CT, PET, SPECT, and MRI. And we have almost same modalities in clinic. So in terms of molecular imaging or in terms of having contrast enhanced diagnostic for cellular and molecular imaging, PET and SPECT are doing a perfect job. You use radioactive uh, or weakly radioactive materials to target the disease cells and you put the patient inside in a scanner and you, you basically map where these particles are accumulated. And those are basically showing you the uh, um, uh, the disease sites, we use magnetic nanoparticles for MRI. Unfortunately, in clinic, we do not have anything for ultrasound. So what does it mean? It means that even, even if I am able to design some particles, design some nanoparticles, small particles, small labels, molecular labels, that they go inside the body and target a specific disease cell I cannot see them with ultrasound imaging. And that is the, that the, and the reason for that is the mechanism in ultrasound imaging is or the mechanism of ultrasound image formation is that you generate ultrasound waves, they penetrate through the tissue, they hit different apps, different basically reflectors in the body, they come back to you. And when we talk about the cellular and molecular labels, they are just too tiny to change the reflectivity or change the echogenicity of the tissue for you to have the uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound images. So unfortunately, ultrasound imaging is by itself is not able to do cellular and molecular imaging, even with the aid of the contrast agents. 
When we talk about the preclinic, in preclinic, we can use very high frequency ultrasound and the very high frequency ultrasound is able to provide the, uh, 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 some, to, some, to some extent it's able to do um, uh, cellular and molecular imaging. But again, those high frequency uh, ultrasound transducer are not translatable to clinical practice and therefore we don't have the cellular molecular imaging or contrast enhanced cellular and molecular ultrasound imaging in clean. So let's see what we want to do. We want to see, we basically want to solve the problem. And the problem is that even if you have contrast agents, nano size or small labels that are tagging or labeling the disease cells, ultrasound by itself is not able to detect the presence of these contrast agents. By the way, I had a slide um, in between that I removed it, but um, um, those of you who are familiar with the field of nanotechnology, you, you probably have better idea about when why we talk about the nano-sized particles or nano-sized contrast agents. So we are trying to label a cell. Cell by itself, the size of the human uh, cells are between a couple of microns to a couple of tens of microns. So when we talk about labeling, it's like that I am, for, for example, asking one of you guys to put a specific hat so that when I go to the class, I say, okay, you are wearing that hat. So you are that person that I was trying to label. So the label itself should be much smaller than the size of the cell. When the cells have the sizes of a couple of microns to a couple of tens of microns, it means that the label should be much smaller. And most of the time, the cellular and molecular imaging labels that we are using are nano-sized. So the main question is that how we adopt ultrasound for cellular and molecular imaging beyond its resolution and sensitivity. So it doesn't have resolution to see the contrast um, um, agents, it doesn't have resolution to see the contrast enhanced cells, targeted cells, and it doesn't have sensitivity to see them. So we have to basically find the solution to overcome this limitation. So um, a couple of techniques that um, are basically developed to address this limitation are for the acoustic imaging magnetomotive ultrasound imaging and the combination of the two, which was kind of a unique modality that we developed at University of Texas. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the photoacoustic imaging and the magnetomotive ultrasound imaging as the solutions, as the solutions to enable ultrasound detecting the nano size contrast agents in the body or detecting the molecular enhanced contrast so that it will become readily available for cellular and molecular imaging. So again, the big picture is how to adopt ultrasound for cellular and molecular imaging. Then we say, we said, if we want to do cellular and molecular imaging, we should enable ultrasound to detect cellular and molecular labels. And we are going to introduce techniques that are based on ultrasound, but they are not traditional ultrasound. And those techniques are able to detect nano size cellular and molecular labels. And if we do this job, we can say that we have a tool that's able to do cellular and molecular image. So photoacoustics. So photoacoustics has a very interesting definition. Remote, uh, which means that we don't need to basically cut the tissue open to see something. So we can basically remotely see something deep inside the tissue. So it's remote or non-invasive or very minimally invasive imaging or sensing of optical properties of the tissue using ultrasound, okay? So think about it. When we talk about optical imaging, it's always having a camera or having a microscope, right? Now I'm telling you something about detecting optical properties of the tissue with ultrasound. So do you see how weird it is? It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that, do you, do, you, do you hear that this color is red? Do you hear this color is blue? Hearing the colors. And this is exactly what we do in photoacoustic imaging. And I will explain it in, in the next couple of slides. So when we do monitor the optical properties of the tissue, we all know that optical imaging is able to provide uh, information about the 
uh, composition of the tissue because different uh, uh, chromophores in the tissue, different components of that are forming the body have different optical properties. So if I am able to probe the optical properties, I can, the first thing I can do is that I can look into the molecular composition of the tissue at a very small scale. And then the very more, or very, or the, the very important other thing that these can do for me is that I can basically make those labels, those nano-sized small contrast agents optically different from the tissue. And if my photoacoustic imaging is able to detect the presence of them, the problem that we just talked about is solved. Now I have a tool that is able to detect nano-sized contrast agents. So I can now break through the limitations of ultrasound and have a tool that can do cellular and molecular image. So for the acoustics, um, the first time I was introduced to this concept, I thought that this couldn't be invented before the year 2000. So I, I, I was at the University of Texas in 2007 and everybody was talking about photoacoustic being a very cool modality that it was, it was probably uh, at, 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 at the very beginning of uh, it's, it's growing uh, a lot into clinical and preclinical applications. And I couldn't imagine that this event or this effect, the uh, photoacoustics effect was invented by this genius Graham Bell back in 1880. Uh, so um, I was hearing that in uh, uh, conferences, I was hearing it from my uh, mentors and I couldn't believe, I was thinking that maybe this is something that they're just saying until somebody actually sent this uh, uh, paper to whole uh, lab that I was doing my PhD and look at the title. The title is Production of Sound by radiant energy. And this is what we mark it as the uh, 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 origin of the photoacoustics field. So what does Graham Bell discover? What he discovered is that if you have a piece of absorbing material, if you have a, for example, let's say you have a black tape and uh, this black tape, if you put it somewhere and uh, have, it ex have, have, have the light exposed to it, it will generate sound for you, right? So you irradiate with radiant energy and the radiant energy could be any form of electromagnetic energy, can be light and you generate sound, right? Gen production of the sound by radiant energy. This is exactly what we do in photoacoustic imaging. In photoacoustic imaging or in biomedical photoacoustic imaging, we irradiate the tissue with the short laser pulses. And I will tell you why we have to use short laser pulses um, in, in a second. But then the laser energy is being absorbed by the chromophores that we have in the body. Chromophores could be blood, could be fat, could be calcium, could be water, anything that has an optical signature. And we know that everything in the nature has an optical signature. Anything in the nature has an absorption properties, scattering properties and reflection properties, right? And this is called the optical signature of the chromophores. Anything in the body, all the chromophores in the body has um, have um, uh, optical signature. So the radiant energy, in this case, the optical um, energy derived by a short pulse laser is absorbed by the, by the tissue, okay? And because we have the position of the energy, the energy of the light energy, the radiant energy quickly converts to heat, right? So you basically heat up the tissue. And now, because you have very short laser pulses, the tissue goes through a thermoelastic expansion, but a very rapid thermoelastic expansion, right? So you heat up something, you basically get a metal ball, you start to heating it up, it basically starts to expand. Now, if imagine that you are heating it up with a very short um, uh, source of energy, short in time source of energy, it expands very quickly, and the expansion, uh, such such quick expansion, generates the acoustic waves. Right. So, do you see the effect for the acoustic effect? Yes, I excite the tissue with um, uh, electromagnetic or uh, light in this case, 
and the tissue starts to talk to me. It generates the sound wave. So this is basically the uh, uh, photoacoustics phenomena that was discovered by Graham Bell um, 140 years ago, and we didn't, nobody used it in, in uh, uh, medicine until uh, probably uh, 20, 25 years ago. All right, so another demonstration. This time I'm showing you why we call this ultrasound-based modality, because everything that we do is being done or all the signal acquisition, acquisition of those uh, for the acoustic generated for the acoustic waves is being done by a normal clinical ultrasound transducer. So I have my ultrasound transducer, similar to the handheld probes that you see in clinic. And all I did is that I put a pulse laser next to it, and I basically deliver the light to the same imaging plane that my ultrasound probe sees. So if my ultrasound probe sees this uh, plane, I try to il illuminate or irradiate the same plane. And I'm just, for the sake of the animation, I'm showing you one single chromophore here that's absorbing the light and generate the photoacoustic signal. So I send the short laser pulse, the laser pulse is being absorbed by the chromophore, not only by this chromophore, by all the chromophores in my imaging plane, but with different rates, depending on their optical properties. Optical um, energy is converted to heat, heat up the um, uh, absorber. It goes through thermoelastic expansion, generates the sound waves, and I am basically detect detecting it with my ultrasound probe. Right, so can I call this ultrasound base? Of course, because the major acquisition uh, system that I'm using here is by ultrasound. So this is by all means ultrasound. I just change the excitation mechanism. If the traditional ultrasound is working by sending pulses and receiving echoes, now I change it to the laser excitation or light excitation, but the signal is still acoustic and I'm receiving it by the ultrasound transducer. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, in, so if you're optically exciting it, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you optically read it? So instead of uh, converting it to acoustics and reading it that way, I could use an infrared detector and, and read it optically. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you mean reading the temperature? Yeah, in, instead of trying to get the acoustic profile, why not get the, uh, the thermal profile using infrared? So you're, right. using, you're, you're using light to read and light to, light to excite and light to read. Right, very good question. So uh, two reasons. First of all, uh, um, and I do not have it on my slide, but here we are talking about 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature increase. We want to look at something. We don't want to cook something. So uh, photoacoustic is basically very minor temperature change, yet it generates a very strong acoustic signal. So it's not like, like the infrared thermometry that your temperature changes by 10 degrees because we cannot have such temperature rise in the body, right? We, we are, we're not trying to do the ablation. We are just trying to do the imaging. So the temperature rise is actually very minor and infrared thermometry is probably not be able to see that. The second reason is that um, uh, we want to do this uh, detection not at the surface. We want to go two, three, four, five centimeters deep inside. And the, the infrared thermometers will have very difficult time to sense minor temperature change when you go deeper inside the tissue. We will not have any problem with the acoustic. So acoustic waves that are generated here can travel centimeters inside the tissue without any problem, but the reflection of the optics will go, it's going to be very difficult because it's going to be a scattered, it's going to be attenuated, and you will basically get nothing at the, at the, at the uh, surface of the body. Uh, very good, thank you for that explanation. Sure. All right, so what is interesting about photoacoustic imaging? So we are listening to the light, right? So now I'm really hearing red, I'm hearing blue, I'm hearing different colors, I'm hearing them, right? And it's not just light, it's the interaction of the light with the molecules, right? It's the interaction of the light with the chromophores that you have in the body. It's the interaction of the light, for example, with hemoglobin. It's the interaction of the light with collagen, with calcium, with water, 
or it's the interaction of the light with the exogenous contrast agents or the contrast molecular labels that you're using to do cellular and molecular imaging, right? So it can provide information for me at a very small scale. It can tell me information about the molecular composition or functional information of the tissue. And I will talk about the functional information in the next slide. And it can also solve that problem that we were addressing at the beginning. Now I'm able to image the small size, nano size uh, molecular contrast agents. What else is interesting about uh, photoacoustic imaging? Well, what is the signal acquisition regimen? Same thing as we are using the sonography, right? So same low price, low cost, uh, durable ultrasound transducers or ultrasound machines that we are using in sonography, in the traditional sonography, we can use them for, uh, for the acoustic imaging. We can use them to acquire the photoacoustic signal and form the images, right? So I have one machine, I let it operate in normal ultrasound mode. How does the normal ultrasound mode works? It sends pulses, receive echoes. Then I shut down the transmit, I use the laser to illuminate, I receive the optical properties of the tissue, and I can make co-registered images of ultrasound and photoacoustic. So two advantages here. One is that I don't need to have an extra hardware to detect the photoacoustic signal. The same ultrasound machine detects the photoacoustic signal. Second, very important, advantage here is that my ultrasound and photoacoustic images can be very easily superimposed on top of each other. Why? Because those of you who are working in image fusion, you will see that there is, you know that there's a lot of problem with registering the images. For example, uh, MRI on CT, uh, ultrasound on MRI, it's very difficult. You basically have to do a lot of complicated procedures to uh, basically map these images on top of each other. Here with ultrasound and photoacoustic images, we have a fixed um, uh, detector for both ultrasound and photoacoustic and the superimposition is very easy. What is the equivalent of these superimposed images? We have PET CT in clinic, right? So PET and CT are co-registered images. CT is showing a structural information PET is showing molecular uh, information, right? Molecular uh, cellular information. Combination of the ultrasound and photoacoustic image can potentially provide the same thing. Ultrasound provides uh, structural background information. Photoacoustic is showing functional and molecular information at a much lower price and at at, with, with a, with a um, um, uh, higher level of safety because you absolutely do not have any ionization. So the laser light that we are using for excitation is not ionizing, ultrasound is not ionizing. So it can be a very, very safe uh, imaging modality or multi-modality tool. Uh, the only limitation is that you have to make sure that you don't basically put too much light energy into the body so that you don't optically damage anything in the body. All right, so a typical combined ultrasound or integrated ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. So you basically have an ultrasound engine uh, um, that basically mostly it's ac uh, acquisition system or transmit and acquisition ultrasound systems. You basically put a pulse laser next to it. And uh, most of the time, the lasers that you're using for photoacoustic imaging are consisted of a pump and an OPO. And OPO is basically, it's an oscillating crystal that is able to provide or generate uh, uh, laser output at different wavelengths. And I will talk in the next couple of slides about why we need to have different colors. And you can probably guess what's the reason because we want to do a spectroscopy. And then everything goes to a probe and the probe looks like something like this. I have my ultrasound probe with the light delivery attached to it, and I can do combined ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. Most of the times, the handheld ultrasound and photoacoustic probes are using optical fibers to get the laser light or laser energy and basically taking it uh, to the integrated probe for illumination. 
So let's take a look at the uh, contrast. So imaging is all about contrast. In ultrasound imaging, the contrast is basically the acoustic impedance or bulk modulus or the density of the tissue. You have bone, which is, which is denser than the soft tissue, and you can very well see the interface of the bone to the soft tissue. You have lungs, which is air, and it's much, um, 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 sorry, bone is denser. Um, air is softer, and you can, very well see the interface of the lung um, um, in the soft tissue. In optical imaging, it's the, the mechanism or the contrast mechanism is uh, index of refraction. Um, in fluorescence imaging, of course, the mechanism is uh, light emitting chrome, uh, chrome, uh, uh, fluorophores that we have in the body. In CT, it's the X-ray absorption or the electron density. In nuclear medicine, is gamma rays. In magnetic resonance imaging, is the relaxation, relaxation time. What is the contrast imaging here in photoacoustic? Is this term here, mu A. What is mu A? Is the optical absorption. So you zap the tissue with the laser light. And depending on how much of your light is being absorbed, you will get stronger or weaker photoacoustic signal. More of the light is being absorbed, you will have more conversion of the light to the heat. You will have stronger uh, thermoelastic expansion. You get a stronger photoacoustic signal. Less absorption is equivalent in photoacoustic to weaker photoacoustic signal. So the photoacoustic images are basically showing the optical absorption coefficient maps of the tissue. So in terms of resolution and penetration depths for the acoustic imaging is a bridge between the optical imaging and ultrasound. Well, optical imaging can provide very high resolution, nice, beautiful images, right? The problem is that you will have very difficult time if you want to go deeper than a millimeter or maybe one, two or three millimeter inside the tissue. So optical imaging is perfect to see the superficial layers with a high resolution, you cannot go deeper. Ultrasound in contrast, will be able to go way deeper inside the tissue. You know that, uh, uh, for example, for the obese patients, we are able to easily see 10, 12, 15 centimeter deep inside the tissue with ultrasound. But the problem is if you want to have such penetration depths, you need to use low frequency ultrasound. And as soon as you start using the low frequency ultrasound, your resolution is going to go uh, by lower, right? So uh, you use one megahertz, your resolution is going to be more than three, 400 microns, which means that you will not be able to resolve any small structures that are smaller than your resolution. What does photoacoustic do in between? Well, photoacoustic is basically fills this gap between the resolution and penetration depths of optical imaging and ultrasound imaging by providing higher resolution images, yet at the um, uh, uh, deeper penetration depths compared to the optical imaging, right? And if you want to think about why I can go deeper, uh, compared to uh, the optical imaging, you can think that in optical imaging, you transmit light, you excite the tissue with light, but your signal that's being generated and you want to detect it is also optical. So you basically have a round trip inside the tissue. In photoacoustic, we do not have the problem of at least the, 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 the signal path uh, when, when the signal is being generated at a certain depth inside the tissue. It's not an optical signal anymore. It's an acoustic signal that can penetrate or can, can travel for centimeters inside the tissue and I can detect it. The other reason for having higher penetration depths is that in a lot of optical imaging techniques, you care about the coherent beam. So you want to have a beam. And if your beam basically gets a lot of a scatter, um, uh, scattering or gets scattered or uh, basically reflected out of your detector zone, you will not be able to detect any signal. We don't have that problem in photoacoustic imaging. We know when the light goes inside, it goes scattered, diffuses into the tissue. We don't care how it diffuses in the tissue. As long as I am able to deliver certain amounts of energy, light energy to a chromophore at a certain depth to heat it up and generate the photoacoustic signal, I am done. I don't care how that photon is delivered to that point. 
I don't care about the coherent uh, straight beam. I can be a completely diffused light. And in fact, in photoacoustic imaging, we take an advantage from the tissue diffusion or the light diffusion inside the tissue. And it basically provides with more uniform signal and um, uh, the enhanced penetration depth. So uh, the photoacoustic signal, that's, uh, that's a, a little bit of physics, but we'll uh, move on very quickly. The initial acoustic pressure that's generated at the site of interaction of the light and the molecules or contrast agents or chromophore is this P naught and P naught is equal to this equation. And this equation will have beta as thermal expansion coefficient. These are basically intrinsic uh, parameters of the tissue. So, uh, Vs is the um, sound speed, Cp is the heat capacity at constant pressure. And the most important parameter here is mu. And then we, of course, have the fluence. So fluence is basically the amount of photons that you have at, at the site of interaction, right? So you put the laser light in, right? And in, at the shallow levels, you have a lot of photons. By the time you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you have absorption, you have attenuation, you have a scattering of the photons, you have also the reflection. So you go deeper inside the tissue, of course, your fluence is lower, right? So your signal, of course, at the lower, at, at the higher penetration depths are going to be weaker. But I will show you in the, the when we talk about the spectroscopy that we don't really care about the amplitude of the signal. We can still use the signal that is affected by the fluence and we get the information about the tissue uh, 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 without any compensation. All right. so. What is the, when we talk about the contrast in photoacoustic imaging being the absorption, we know that the absorption is the wavelength dependent, right? So when we talk about blood being red, it means that it basically absorbs the light at almost or at, at, at uh, wavelengths, except for the red and red is being reflected to our, to our eye. This is why we see the blood as red, right? So I am showing to you the graphs of the absorption coefficients of major components that we have in the body. And of course we can talk about calcium, we can talk about different things that we have in the body, but the major things that we have in the body are blood and blood is, can be in two forms, can be fresh blood or oxygenated blood or um, deoxygenated blood or oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin. And then we have the absorption of the fat and water. Okay, so you see that the absorption properties are wavelength dependent, which means that I choose a wavelength for my laser and I can anticipate which component among these four is the stronger. For example, if I use 700 nanometer, I can just go to this graph and I say that if I'm getting a very, very strong signal, by just looking at this graph, I can guess that this is probably coming from the oxyhemoglobin. Why? Because oxyhemoglobin is much a stronger absorber at these wavelengths compared to deoxyhemoglobin and fat and water are not really absorbing much at these wavelengths. Well, this is a logarithmic scale. So uh, differences on the vertical uh, direction are basically should, should, should be considered as a, as a logarithmic scale. So back to the main question that the main problem that we want to solve. Remember we wanted to use for the acoustic imaging for detecting the molecular and cellular labels, right? And we always would like to image deeper inside the tissue, right? So in, in other words, I want to have molecular contrast agents that are able to absorb the light deeper inside the tissue, or in other words, at those wavelengths, at those colors of the light that I can penetrate deep inside the tissue. What do we see here? The blood is very strong absorber at the low uh, 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 wavelengths as I'm showing to you from 300 to 1300 nanometer. So close to 400, 500 nanometer, blood is a very strong absorber. Then the absorption of the blood decreases, but then when we go to higher wavelengths as to far infrared range, the water and fat are starting to absorb a lot. And each of these, if they absorb my laser energy, it means that I'm losing the penetration depth. I want to 
excite a molecular label that I designed and it's targeted a cell three centimeter deep inside the tissue, I need to deliver the light to that three centimeter, right? So by looking at this, you can see that somewhere between 650, 600, 650 nanometer to 900, 950 nanometer is kind of a sweet spot for having more penetration depths for the laser light. Why? The absorption of the blood is significantly decreased, at least compared to the uh, visible range. Water and uh, fat are not absorbing much at these wavelengths. And it basically provides me with a sweet spot to have more penetration depth of my laser into the body. So in my class, I always have a green and the red laser. And if you put a green laser, you can do that experiment yourself. You put a green laser on your uh, finger, you turn it on, you barely see anything. Uh, don't, don't see your finger lights up. You put a red laser, you do that, you see that your finger light uh, kind of lights up. What's the reason? At green, I have a lot of absorption by blood. So my laser light is immediately absorbed at the surface by the blood, nothing penetrates. At the red, at least compared to the green, I have lower absorption. So it lets some of the laser light to penetrate into my finger. And if you go beyond the red, if you go to infrared, near infrared, you basically have even more penetration depths uh, in the body. So if I want to design a molecular contrast agent, if I want to design a label that goes and label cancer cells in the body, for example, I basically want them to have their strongest optical absorption or their peak absorption in the range that I call it the optical window. And you go do this uh, the search in literature, you will see that people have explored all different types of uh, contrast agents for photoacoustic imaging. So we have metallic nanoparticles such as gold and silver, and you can basically play with the geometry, you can play with the shape, you can make them as rods, you can make them as stars, you can make them as, I don't know, octopuses, anything that you can imagine you can find it in literature. And I'm the wrong person to ask questions how to make them because I am a system engineer, I'm not a chemist, but I happen to work with chemists and those chemists were amazing. They were able to basically uh, uh, change the structure of the metallic nanoparticles and tune their absorption um, uh, peak um, to any wavelengths that you want. We were working with somebody at University of Texas and we wanted to have 780 nanometer. The next day we wanted to have 790 nanometer. And those are people were able to basically change their chemistry, change the structure of the nanoparticles and tune the absorption peak to the wavelengths that we want. So gold and silver are being used for this purpose, of course. If we talk about the clinical applications, metallic nanoparticles are still being investigated to move to clinical applications, but we have already uh, clinically approved dyes such as Alexafluor, ICG, IR800, and those are absorbers. Well, these are the fluorophores that they have to absorb the light to emit. But if we can use just their absorption for photoacoustic imaging, we can use them for as contrast agent for photoacoustic imaging. And um, um, uh, some groups looked into using the uh, carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes for contrast agents. So if you look at this, you see that that optical window between 600 to 900, 950 is pretty much covered by carbon nanotubes, dyes, metallic nanoparticles. And of course you can get liposome particles and you can load it with different types of these particles so that you can have multiple absorption, have broad absorption. So it's, it's, it's a word of uh, innovation to make novel contrast agents for photoacoustic image. All right, so, so far photoacoustic imaging is sensitive or basically is providing an absorption map, right? So uh, when I zap the tissue, and let's say that I have a tissue, I basically injected contrast agents. I know it's peak absorption. It basically in the, my, in the blood flow, it's some of it, it's accumulated in the tumor. Some of it is still in the blood. And I'm trying to basically do photoacoustic imaging to find where those particles are accumulated. So the first thing, 
um, I, I learned in, in photoacoustic imaging is that turn on a laser, zap the tissue with the laser and take a look at the images. And I did that and guess what? I got the signal all over the place. Why? Because my contrast agents absorbs the light, generates the photoacoustic signal, but blood absorbs the light and blood happens to be a very strong absorber and blood absorbs um, uh, then generates contrast or generates a photoacoustic signal. Anything else in my surrounding generates a photoacoustic signal. So the first time I did the photoacoustic imaging, I saw a photoacoustic imaging experiment. I was like, what does this image even mean? I see the signal everywhere. And then I was basically very lucky that I was working with a very group, a smart group of people. And they showed me that, wait a second, this is just an image that you got from a single wavelength. And there is a concept that's called a spectroscopy. And a spectroscopy means that I can tune my laser light. And instead of acquiring the PA at only one wavelength, I can basically acquire at multiple wavelengths or at multiple laser colors. And then I can basically take those images to my computer, do a post-processing and very beautiful uh, or very beautifully uh, decompose the signal and show you what component of the signal is coming from the contrast agent, what component is coming from the blood. I can go deeper. I can tell you what component is coming from oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, and I can basically resolve for all the chromophores if I repeat my uh, for the acoustic acquisition at multiple wavelengths. So how do we do that? We know that the photoacoustic signal is proportional to the absorption, right? And what is the absorption? Absorption is basically uh, the product of the concentration and something that we call it intrinsic optical properties or intrinsic um, 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 absorption coefficient or we call it extinction coefficient, right? So for a second, let's forget about fat and water. Let's just imagine that I have a blood vessel and that blood vessel have oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, and I injected my contrast agent and I call the contrast agent nanoparticle, right? So when I want to uh, resolve this um, uh, signal that I'm getting, it means that I want to resolve for the concentration. I want to say that, Tell me at each pixel of this image, what is the concentration of oxyhemoglobin? What is the concentration of deoxyhemoglobin? And what is the concentration of the nanoparticle? So if I do that, then I can provide a map that tells where the particles are accumulated, where is oxyhemoglobin, where is deoxyhemoglobin? So what do I have here in these equations? These extinction coefficients are known. I synthesize the nanoparticles, I know at the, the optical absorption of it. I can basically make the nanoparticles, I can put it in a UV spectrometer and measure the optical properties of my uh, contrast agents. So the extinction coefficient of contrast agents, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin is known. What is, known, what is not known here? The concentrations. This is what I'm after to measure or to calculate using the photoacoustic imaging. How many unknowns we have? We have three unknowns in this specific example. If I want to solve for these three unknowns, I should generate three equations. How do I generate that three equations? I basically repeat my photoacoustic acquisition at three different wavelengths. Wavelengths one, wavelengths two, wavelengths three. And then I will have three equations. I can go do the math or solve it with, with different different techniques you want. You can do numerical iterations. You can basically try to find an analytical solution, different thing, or you can do, I don't know, inverse matrix, algebraic equation um, uh, solver, but you will be able with three equations to solve for these concentrations, right? So I basically repeat this at multiple wavelengths, depending on how many chromophores I want to resolve for. And this is, this is not just for photoacoustic, this is for optical spectroscopy that, that uh, we do exact same concept. And then by doing that, I'm not going to go through this, but I am able to basically resolve for the nanoparticles for oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. So this is, a, this is an image of a xenograft tumor 
and the animal was injected by gold nanoparticles. And gold nanoparticles, we have their optical properties or we have that epsilon or extinction coefficient. We had the uh, extinction coefficient for deoxyhemoglobin, for oxyhemoglobin, and we basically imaged between 740 and 840 nanometer. And then for this specific um, example, we tried to also compensate for the fluence but you don't really need to compensate for the fluence because when you are trying to do the spectral analysis, you're looking at how the signal is varying from one wavelength to another wavelength. So if your fluence is lower, everything is scaled down. If your fluence is higher, everything is scaled up. And you can catch me right there and say, no, you are not right because the optical properties of the tissue is wavelength dependent. And I am 100% agreeing with you, but in a lot of photoacoustic applications, we just neglect the uh, um, optical dependence of the scattering or uh, 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 tissue dependence absorption and scattering that affects the fluence. And we just basically look into the change of the signal to do a spectroscopic imaging. So my photoacoustic imaging was able to locate where these nanoparticles are accumulated and it also gave me two very other, uh, two uh, important maps too. So it basically gave me the relative concentration for oxyhemoglobin and relative concentration for deoxyhemoglobin. And if I combine the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin map, I get something that we call it oxygen saturation map. And believe me, oxygen saturation map is a very important functional information. In a lot of diseases, measuring the oxygen concentration or concentration of oxyhemoglobin with respect to the total hemoglobin in the blood is very important. We know that advanced tumors go more hypoxic. Um, a lot of other diseases called ischemia or low oxygen concentration. And this is a very important clinical functional information that we can easily acquire with photoacoustic image. So photoacoustic imaging or spectroscopic photoacoustic imaging is ultrasound based. So I should be able to scan volumetry. So this is ultrasound scan. This is for the acoustic signal at one wavelength. Um, um, sorry, this is for the acoustic signal at 800 nanometer. Again, you see that I'm getting signal from everywhere, but I can decompose the signal and get the relative concentration of oxy, deoxy, hemoglobin, and the nanoparticle. So this is before injection. You see that I do not resolve any spectrum that correlates with the presence of the nanoparticles. Of course, there is some, and those are just a computational error that's showing me some concentration of the gold. I know that there is no gold in here, but any imaging will have certain amount of inaccuracy. Take a look at this image here. After the accumulation of the nanoparticles in the tumor, now I can very well see how they are accumulated in the metabolically active area of the tumor. And then we confirm this. Um, 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 we confirm this with the histology. Of course, the images can be three D, and this is basically the equivalent of the uh, PET CT that I was telling you. In PET CT, you have CT providing the structural information similar to what ultrasound is providing here. You see the structure of the mouse body, you see where the tumor is located, but then you also see the molecular information that PET provides and its equivalent here is for the acoustic image. We confirm this result with the histology. So uh, there's a specific type of staining called silver stain that basically reveals the presence of gold. And you can see how well the, the accumulation of the gold uh, in histology matches with the signal that we received in photoacoustic imaging. So what question are we answered? We kind of came up with an imaging modality that is able to go beyond the limitation of ultrasound image and provide or detect the presence of small sized, nano sized contrast agents. So. Now, if I have a very good chemist biologist next to me and they are able to basically functionalize these small particles to go inside the body and selectively target the disease tissue, now I have an imaging tool that I can go find where these are distributed and I can effectively do cellular and molecular imaging. So um, 
the most important uh, endogenous contrast, so without contrast agents, so uh, I'm, I'm going to switch gear and talk about what information we can get just from the chromophores that exist inside the body. So the first uh, uh, important information we can get is the presence of blood. So we can very well see the vascularity of the tissue. And because the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin have different absorption properties, we can basically distinguish between them or we can basically differentiate them, calculate the relative concentration of uh, the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and um, uh, calculate the SO2 map or, or oxygen saturation map. So I'm going to skip this fast, uh, but, but, but there are tons of papers published on this. So one application that we are working in lab, uh, in my lab is that we are trying to basically develop a transvaginal ultrasound and photodiagnostic probe for monitoring the fetal brain oxygenation um, uh, during the birth. So at the active stage of the labor, when the cervix is open, when the head is exposed and the contractions start, there is a high chance that the uh, blood delivery or oxygen delivery to the brain is interrupted. And that basically caused huge um, uh, neurological issues for the, for the babies, um, uh, which cannot be detected by, by, for example, the fetal heart rate monitor. So we try to basically do use this transvaginal probe to monitor the oxygenation in the brain. We have done some ex vivo studies. Well, this is far away from clinic now because we have to do a lot of development safety um, and those kind of things and large animal studies before we move to clinic. But we have shown that the photoacoustic uh, oxygen measurement is very accurate compared to the uh, standard tool, which is a blood gas analyzer. When you get a drop of blood, and you put it inside the machine and basically does the uh, gas analyzing and gives you the uh, concentration of the oxygen. So what else we can do with photoacoustic imaging? Well, photoacoustic imaging is basically growing fast in cancer detection and staging. Why? Because there are certain important cancer characteristics that we can image with photoacoustic imaging. We can Take a look at, we can, we can image vascular density or angiogenesis. We can image hypoxia. We can image melanoma. Melanoma is a very strong optical absorber. We can use molecular targets or do cellular molecular imaging. And one specific clinical application is that we can do um, lymph node map, mapping, um, uh, similar to what people do with the uh, 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 um, um, the dyes or radioactive material, you can inject the contrast agents into the primary tumor and see how they uh, basically um, uh, go into the adjacent lymph node. And that basically shows the engagement of the lymph nodes. It has an application in cardiology because we can image the lipid. So we can uh, basically distinguish the lipid rich um, uh, plaques. Um, uh, compared to the healthy uh, 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 arteries. So if you have lipid accumulation, you can see it well with photoacoustic imaging. People are trying to basically image the um, calcium cap on the plaques so that they can basically find which plaques are uh, risky plaques, which are the uh, less risky plaques. So a bunch of things you can do in cardiology. One very important, uh, simple to me um, uh, application is to image basically objects, external objects that you need to navigate into the body. You need to place an stent. You can very well see the stent because the stent is made of metal. Metal is a very strong optical absorber and you can see it very well. You want to put brachytherapy seats. Those are metal. Metal absorbs light much stronger than the background tissue. So you can see them very well into the tissue background. You want to do a biopsy, you need to guide your needle. You can very well do it with photoacoustic imaging because the needle is a very strong absorber. So one um, research that we do in my lab is that we try to use photoacoustic imaging to uh, navigate or accurately navigate the ablation catheter, laser ablation catheters for venous insufficiencies. So 
This is a photoacoustic image. This is combined ultrasound photoacoustic image. Ultrasound image is seeing the whole fiber or the whole catheter. Photoacoustic signal is only being generated at the tip of the fiber. So I can basically see where the tip is located, where the body is located. And when I tilt the ultrasound, when I tilt the catheter to go into, for example, perforating veins, I lose the ultrasound image of it. Why? Because ultrasound based works based on the pulse echo. So if you have something with an angle, your pulses hits that object, but the echo is not basically, it's going out of plane, you are not receiving it. So we go beyond 35, 40 degrees, or even, even less, maybe 25 degrees, we lose the uh, ultrasound visibility, but for the acoustic signal that generates at the, that is being generated at the tip, it's kind of omnidirectional, and we will basically detect it uh, independent from the angle. So ultrasound is angular dependent, photoacoustic is not, and this is a huge advantage in navigation. So these are images that the catheter was not seen or not well visualized in ultrasound, but photoacoustic is able to visualize it very well. So uh, Various for the acoustic technology in terms of clinical applications. Well, there's more than 30 clinical trials of for the acoustic for breast, ovarian, infant, brain, skin, and different applications. Um, you can go to clinical trials uh, website and you can see how many for the acoustic uh, uh, the clinical trials are being done for ovarian cancer, uh, cervical cancer. There's a bunch of uh, clinical trials and day by day, there are more clinical trials. And actually very recently, like two months ago, the first uh, for the acoustic system got FDA approval for breast cancer staging, breast cancer imaging by a company called Sono Medical in Houston. And uh, they got FDA approval for the physicians to use photoacoustic information to upgrade or downgrade patients between BIRAT categories of the, of the breast cancer. In terms of industry, a bunch of companies are making preclinical and clinical machines. And I just listed a couple of them. Uh, the photoacoustic market, like the appli clinical applications is, is growing really fast. So you can see that compared to 2010, which was almost no market, everything was in the research lab on the, the bench. Now we have a lot of things in on the bedside and in clinic and the market is growing relatively fast. All right, um, I am going to switch gear and talk about the other modality, which is called uh, magnetomotive ultrasound imaging. It's going to be very quick then quickly talk about, uh, probably in the next 10 minutes, I'll talk about magnetomotive and elasticity imaging, and then we'll talk about the specific research that we are doing. So magnetomotive ultrasound imaging, um, um, it's, as it's, you can uh, probably uh, sense from the name, we are dealing with something magnetic, right? And in for the acoustic imaging, the source of the contrast was optical, in this case, the source of the contrast is magnetic. So we try to use magnetic nanoparticles as contrast agent. And when we talk about the contrast here, we talk about the huge contrast. So our body is not magnetic. So you walk by a very strong magnet, you're not stuck to the magnet because our body is weak diamagnetic actually. Compared to, for example, iron oxide, particles, iron particles, we have a huge contrast, like six orders of magnitude in magnetic susceptibility. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you how we can use this huge magnetic contrast between body and um, uh, these con magnetic nanoparticles to basically generate an image. So with a cartoon, I'm showing you uh, how the magnetomotive ultrasound works. Let's assume that you have a tissue, like a lever, and uh, it's just, just a plain lever, and you apply a magnetic field. And I'm not talking about RF, I'm not talking about MRI RF, I'm talking about like a pulse or sinusoidal magnetic field. Because the tissue is weakly diamagnetic, there is no interaction or there is no effective interaction between the magnetic field and the tissue. But as soon as you label the cells in this tissue with magnetic nanoparticles such as iron oxide, so for example, you 
label the cells uh, with iron oxide nanoparticles, and now you excite them with the magnetic field, what happens? The magnetic particles are being dragged by the magnets, right? And then they are not free to move. They are located in a viscoelastic medium. So there is a magnetic force, drag force, and then tissue elasticity force that's opposing it. And if you drag them with a pulse and then you turn off your magnet or release them, they basically start to vibrate. Where is the ultrasound? The well, ultrasound comes for the detection of the displacement. We know that ultrasound is a very accurate, strong tool to monitor tiny displacements in the tissue. So how this mechanism works, I label the cells with magnetic nanoparticles. I excite it with a magnetic field, either sinusoidal, or harmonic, or a pulse. And then I look for my ultrasound probe where in the tissue is moving synchronously to my magnetic excitation. And those are the areas that my magnetic particles are located. So I image magnetic nanoparticles, another solution to go beyond the limitations of ultrasound, I can do cellular molecular imaging. So the magnetomotive force or the magnetic drag force depends on the size of the particles, uh, depends on what fraction of it is magnetic depends on the susceptibility. This is the main mechanism of the contrast. And of course, it depends on how strong your field is and what is the gradient of the field. By the way, you cannot have a constant field because if you have a constant field, there is no magnetic gradient to move the particle. So you should have a magnetic gradient, which fortunately with any magnet that you put next to the body, you always have a gradient. You have a strong field closer to the magnet and you go farther away from the magnet, the magnetic field decreases and that generates the gradient for you. In terms of detection of the displacement, I'm not going through the details, but there are many, many ways to detect sub-micron tissue displacement with photoacoustic imaging. You basically receive an echo that looks like this signal in white. And if it moves by certain amount in your next transmission of the pulse and receiving the echoes, you can easily find how much the signal is shifted. And you can basically relate that to the uh, displacement of the tissue. So showing you an example, this is an experiment that we did. We labeled microfish cells with iron oxide nanoparticles and see what happens when I turn on a magnet. So I have a sinusoidal excitation and you see how well visualized, visible motion I have in these cells. So imagine that I do it in the body, somewhere a lesion in the uh, 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 liver, a lesion, I don't know, somewhere deep inside the skin is tagged with magnetic nanoparticles. I put a magnet to excite and I just put my ultrasound to detect a displacement like I showed to you. And that basically does the um, uh, magnetic contrast or magnetomotive ultrasound imaging. So we did um, uh, uh, studies in animals. So again, this is a xenograft tumor. Um, this is a mouse that uh, we imaged before accumulation of the nanoparticles, before injection. Top row is when the magnetic excitation is off. The uh, bottom row is when we excite it with the magnetic field. So you can see that before accumulation, I don't get a meaningful signal. Of course, I we detected some motion, some motion that they are, they're not real, but we know that the tissue is moving. My signal acquisition might have lag jitter and those are basically the existing limitations that we have for this system but compared the upper panels with the lower panels when we have the magnetic nanoparticles accumulated in the tumors and now i excited them with the magnetic field now you can see what huge signal i detect compared to when the magnetic signal was not sorry magnetic excitation was not there and i can very well see where the particles are accumulated in this tumor. Similar to photoacoustic, this is also a volumetric. This is kind of equivalent to ultrasound photoacoustic imaging. Now I see ultrasound structure, magnetomotive molecular, and I can superimpose them on top of each other. I can see the structure. I can see the accumulation of the nanoparticles. All right, um, very quickly. What is the goal in, uh, in a lot of clinical procedure? A patient comes to the clinic, you 
and complains about that, have a symptom. So you basically scan the patient, you find a problem, you find a disease, right? What is next? You put the patient on a therapy. Does it mean that the patient doesn't have to come back for the diagnostic or doesn't need to have any guidance or imaging guidance during the therapy? No, most of the time, there is a circle between therapy and diagnostic. So you diagnose, send the patient for therapy, you monitor the patient during the therapy, you take a look at the patient uh, again after a certain therapy to see whether the disease is gone or it's basically uh, the patient is on a remission or the disease is still there. So there's always a loop. So if we go through a lot of troubles to generate or a lot of technological advancement to generate contrast agents for cellular and molecular imaging, we prefer not to use them just for imaging. So we prefer to use them also for the therapy, right? One example, I use gold nanoparticles, right? I use gold nanoparticles and I basically make them contrast agents for photoacoustic imaging. I also want to use those gold nanoparticles to do the treatment. So if I make them go and label the um, uh, cellular and um, um, the, um, uh, sorry, the, the specific disease cells, I want to detect them, but if there is an opportunity for me to selectively kiss those, those cells that are targeted, I want to do that. So I'll just show you one quick example of how we do that under the umbrella of the nanotechnology. So I am showing you how we can do diagnostic and therapy under the umbrella of nanotechnology. Um, so example of the gold nanoparticles, I basically label the cells, label the cancer cells with the gold nanoparticles, I zap them with the short laser pulses, and I detect the photoacoustic signal so I can locate where they are, where they are located. But, but, if I, use, if I use continuous wave laser, I can induce heat, I can induce phototermal therapy into those cells and effectively destroy them, right? So I have cells that are having optical absorber in them. I send a short laser pulse, not much temperature increase. I detect those cells. So I say, okay, these are, these are my cells. And it makes sense, like based on uh, whatever assumption that I have, yes, this is, this, this was what I was looking for, the cells are here. I can now turn off my pulse laser, ten, turn on a continuous wave laser and do a selective phototermal therapy. When I am doing phototermal therapy, I am constantly or with a with continuous wave laser, keep heating up these cells, or keep heating up these contrast um, or optical absorbers inside the cells until they reach to a temperature that they basically destroy the cells. But I also want to make sure that I am not damaging the surrounding tissue. I'm only killing the disease cells, not the surrounding tissue. How can I monitor the temperature um, uh, that's, uh, that's being basically induced? Can I put a thermocouple? I don't want to do invasive procedure. The very good news is that photoacoustic is also able to provide the temperature map for you. So, one term in photoacoustic signal that we, I skipped it in this presentation is that photoacoustic signal is the function of the temperature. You have an absorber inside the environment and you keep increasing the temperature of the environment, your photoacoustic signal is increasing too. So I not only locate where these cells are uh, placed so that I can do the treatment, I can also monitor the procedure I can also monitor the treatment procedure by monitoring the temperature. So this is just one example of how the nanotechnology or nanocontrast agents are not being used just for diagnostic, but also for the therapy. And this is why we are very interested in the theranostic procedures or combination of the treatment and the diagnostic. All right, very quickly, um, uh, tissue elastography. This is the, um, yeah, another whole the new domain um, for um, um, or another way of uh, advancing ultrasound technology. So what is elastography? So in very ancient, in, in, sorry, um, old paintings or very, very old uh, uh, textbooks from um, ancient um, 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 Egypt or Greek uh, books, um, you see pictures like this. So 
it seems to be a physician in the, in the, in the modern, modern world it, uh, that it's um, for the, those ages. And there is somebody, probably a patient, and you see what these guys are doing? They're pulping, right? They're trying to feel what's going on. So these patients complaining about something. And one of the first things that the physician do is that they touch the body to see if they feel any abnormality. When we touch something, what is it that we are feeling? The stiffness, right? So this is 5,000 years ago. And let me tell you one very interesting story. Even today, a lot of women coming to clinic and they're being diagnosed with the breast cancer, they, they feel it by, by just touching and feel some abnormality in the breast, right? So I have to, I, I happen to remember the percentage when I was at Mayo Clinic, but it was a huge percentage, maybe above 60% of the patients that were coming to clinic for being, to go on their clinical procedures for more accurate, more accurate diagnostic, they were waking up in the morning, they were feeling some abnormal lesions or abnormal stiffness in the breast, and they were basically coming uh, to clinic for the follow-up procedure. So what is it that we do here? It's we basically, in a sense, we, we do elastography. When you palp the tissue, when you feel the stiffness, you do elastography. Elastography means measurements of elasticity, measurements of a stiffness. If we go into physics of elastography, you basically have a three-stage procedure. You have to excite the tissue, right, with an energy source. And then the energy source is basically makes a mechanical deformation or impact, make a movement into the tissue. And then you have to basically measure the induced tissue motion or deformation. And you can basically do quantitative or qualitative assessment. When you do the palpation, it's qualitative because say, I feel this is a stiff. So you do that, I basically touch you and say, no, this is absolutely fine. That there is no abnormality here. So we try to make this perception of the stiffness more um, quantitative in, in clinic. So uh, ultrasound happens to be a, the very suitable tool to do both excitation or generating this deformation in the body and also detecting the displacement, right? Remember, we need to deform the tissue and then take a look at the deformation of the tissue. For example, I pulp the tissue with a known force and more deformation means that this tissue is softer, less deformation means that the tissue is um, uh, more stiff, right? So we can do both palpation or remote palpation and uh, the measurement of the deformation using ultrasound. And that brings me to a very interesting concept called acoustic radiation force. So I have an ultrasound transducer that I use it safely for imaging. If I focus all, all the ultrasound energy, and I can absolutely do that by the, the sequencing the transmit of multiple elements in this transducer so that all the energy focuses at a certain point, I can make a mechanical impact. I can literally pulp the tissue, but not at the surface, a couple of centimeters deep inside the tissue. This is called acoustic radiation force. I do that, the tissue starts to deform and I can use different ways to measure this uh, deformation. I can detect multiple deformation. I can detect the compression expansion. I can see if shear waves are being generated and I can do elastography. And this is exactly what we do in uh, elastography. So I have a movie here just to show you that we actually have an acoustic pressure generating something. So it's ultrasound transducer focused at the surface of the water. And you see, I increased the power of this ultrasound transducer. I made a fountain, now I basically boiled the water. So acoustic radiation force is actually a very strong force. So you can basically put an ultrasound probe on the body and you can make a mechanical impact deep inside the body. People are using, uh, strong ultrasound uh, signals to do the cavitation, to do the treatment. So there are different ways of, after making an impact on the body, uh, by using ultrasound to detect 
different types of displacement, different types of deformation and do different types of elastography. The one that I'm going to show to you is called shear rave elastography. And the very simple way of describing shear rave elastography is that you have a ball of jelly, you tap on it, you see that the surface starts to move, right? Um, or starts to vibrate. It's kind of like the waves are being generated and, and are basically propagating away from the impact point. And based on the physics mechanics, we know that the faster these waves move, it means that the tissue is more elastic. The slower they move, there the tissue is less elastic. So I use ultrasound to generate that impact. I see how the waves are moving. I detect the waves. I detect how the displacement happens in the tissue. I can track the waves. I can measure the propagation speed. I can do the el elastography. Right, let's skip this. Uh, this was a movie. So one technique that we were using at Mayo Clinic, it was developed and then uh, was moved to clinical application is that instead of having single uh, impact point we use to have laterally spaced multiple impact point so that we can have a larger field of view because when the shear waves are propagating from the impact point they tend to die um, um, at a certain distance so if you impact uh, multiple points laterally spaced from each other uh, you can basically generate more accurate and wider um, field of view uh, shear wave elastography so i had a phantom with a stiff inclusion and the propagation speed of the shear wave in the stiff inclusion is larger than the background. And I can see it very well in my uh, shear wave elastography. I can basically quantitatively measure the stiffness of this inclusion here. So in terms of clinical application, one clinical application that we explored was the thyroid cancer. And the reason for the thyroid cancer is people are coming with thyroid nodules and they go to biopsy. Biopsy means that they have to put a needle into your neck to take a sample from the thyroid. It's a very painful uh, procedure. And a big percentage of those um, uh, the abnormalities are just normal. They're just benign. So we proposed to put elastography in between because the hypothesis was that Normal tissue is softer than benign and malignant is basically harder. And there are, when you can go to literature, you can read a lot what's happening in, when the cancer grows, uh, basically changes the structure of the extracellular matrix. And this is the reason that this cancerous tissue becomes stiffer compared to the normal tissue. So example of the normal thyroid um, region, there is no nodule here. You see that the uh, uh, shear wave elasticity map is uh, normal and it's relatively soft. If you have a benign nodule, you see that this elasticity is elevated in the nodule. And if you have unfortunate malignant case, it's not only elevated, but it's higher than the benign. So elasticity can potentially can potentially eliminate some of the unnecessary biopsies. You have a nodule, instead of doing the biopsy, you do the elastography, the physician tells you that this is a very soft nodule. I don't think it's cancer. Why don't you just go come back in two months, three months, six months? And then if I do see, if you see the nodule change the size, uh, change, uh, there's a size change and there's a stiffness change, then I put you on the treatment or I basically do the biopsy to see whether it's malignant or not. Same thing for the breast. Breast uh, lesions, the benign and malignant will have significantly different um, elastic modulus, but of course there's always an overlap. So you have some malignant lesions that are on the softer side, you have benign lesions that are on the harder side. So there is always an overlap. And there's a lot of active research literature on how to interpret these shear wave elastographies, how to read these elasticity maps, what threshold to set to say this is a benign or malignant. All right, I'm going to skip this part. This, is, this was another application of the um, uh, elasticity, but let me skip this part and tell you what we are doing in, in my lab very briefly. So my lab is basically located in a building called Integrative Bioscience, and it's a very nice collaborative environment uh, for uh, researchers from different areas to explore ideas. Um, uh, 
basically have a couple of projects in the lab. Uh, I have a very uh, um, talented team of students working on these projects and we have been successful to secure some funding from National Institute of Health and Department of Defense and fund eight different foundations um, and uh, industry collaborators to conduct our research. So um, we basically are trying to combine ultrasound for the acoustic and elasticity for different applications. So we try to basically make devices that can do ultrasound for the acoustic and elasticity for different applications. Major applications that we are working on is to enhance the fetal, maternal, and neonatal care and breast cancer. And then we have some, uh, um, uh, how to say more preliminary project related to uh, developing endoscopic system for imaging and therapy and for photoacoustic using photoacoustic for guiding the interventions in a specific ablation procedures. So in terms of, uh, of ultrasound photoacoustic and elasticity for uh, enhanced fetal, neonatal, and maternal care. We basically got a, a transvaginal ultrasound transducer and we implemented for the acoustic by designing a light delivery. And we also implemented the acoustic radiation force elastography. And the goal is that we want to basically do two things. We want to image cervix, uh, human cervix, uh, and get information about the uh, molecular composition, cellular molecular composition, stiffness and ultrasound microstructure that can potentially be used for predicting the preterm birth uh, because of the insufficiencies in the cervix. And then the second application, which, is, which I briefly explained was to image the fetal brain. So basically implement all of uh, these in a single uh, probe. So the probe is unique. You put the probe next to a tissue, you can acquire ultrasound images. You can acquire multiple wavelengths for the acoustic images after the ultrasound and for the acoustic acquisition is done. We switch to ultrasound elasticity and we can acquire the shear wave elastography maps. So it's one probe placement, turning on the machine, acquiring all these three modalities information in less than five minutes. And the normal ultrasound scan is around one to two minutes to three to sometimes longer. So five minutes is absolutely clinically accepted. So problem we are targeting, one of them is the preterm birth. So 10% uh, of the babies are being born um, earlier than term. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge percentage and it's basically a very major problem. It causes a lot of uh, bah, 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 difficulties for the babies, difficulties for the uh, mothers, and uh, the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And in a specific, we have uh, uh, a lot of issue in the United States. $26 billion is the um, annual cost associated with this, basic the consequences of the preterm birth. So what's happening that causes the preterm birth? So we know that the baby is inside the uterus and the uterus is basically in a sense locked with the cervix. And this cervix is a muscular structure that during the pregnancy, it goes shorter and shorter and shorter, but also softer and softer and softer. And it also changes in the mechanical composition or molecular composition until it reaches to the term and opens up and the baby comes up. So if these changes, if, if these changes happens untimely or something happens and for example, an infection inside the uterus causes the cervix to go on their undesired molecular composition change or a stiffness change, that is one of the, that's one major cause of the preterm birth. So right now in clinic, most of the measurements are just by ultrasound to measure the cervical length. So just a structure, just the length. And they say that if the cervix is long, um, the patient is probably fine, it's not at risk. If the cervix is short, the patient's at risk. And unfortunately that doesn't have enough sensitivity and specificity because we are ignoring a lot of parameters. We don't know whether how the collagenous network of the cervix is changed. We don't know whether there's water diffused to the, the tissue and making it uh, softer, making it basically more ready to funnel or open. We don't know the mechanical strengths of the cervix is changed or not. So 
our goal is basically to combine ultrasound photoacoustic and elasticity to measure the elasticity. And in terms of photoacoustic, one very important parameter that we are measuring is we are looking into change in the collagen network. So we know that the collagen is basically holding the cervix together. And by the time uh, that the mother goes throughout the pregnancy, these collagen networks closer to the term starts to basically disintegrate or basically the collagen network breaks, water diffuses in the tissue. And that's one of the major reasons that the cervix cuts open. So if we are able to monitor this process of collagen remodeling, that's a very important molecular composition detection of the cervical change leading to the preterm birth or leading to the birth. So we did a bunch of studies. We did in the animals, uh, non-pregnant animals, uh, pregnant animals at different gestational age. So when the when uh, the mouse model that we are using, when the uh, mouse is at the mid-pregnancy, you see how the tissue is kind of uh, uh, have the consistency or the tissue, this is the HNES thing showing that the tissue is not decomposed. We see a very strong collagen network at term when these mouse are, are ready to give birth to the, um, um, uh, to the babies. You see that the tissue is kind of decomposed. There's a lot of water perfused into the tissue and this collagen network is almost gone. So we were able to detect this very carefully with photoacoustic imaging when we defined the parameter that we called it con uh, collagen to water ratio. And that collagen to water ratio was able to basically very well show the process of the cervical ripening in the tissue. We did that also on the human samples. In the human samples, we were also be able to see the signal change between the difference between the non-pregnant and pregnant. Um, services and now we are trying to move forward to the clinical application for the elasticity we've done in vivo studies and we have shown that throughout the pregnancy the stiffness of the cervix decreases and one thing we are trying to do is quantitative ultrasound so we know by the structural change microstructural change in the tissue the, the appearance of the photo uh, the, sorry the appearance of the ultrasound signals are changing so you basically have backscatter coefficient, backscatter power attenuation. Those are the quantitative parameters that you can get from the ultrasound images. And those are changing and we are after doing that. So the goal of this project is that we want to combine all these uh, parameters that you can get from ultrasound for the acoustic elasticity and see how well we can enhance the diagnostic power of the cervical lengths so that potentially we detect the patients at risk of preterm birth more accurately earlier and prevent the risk of the preterm birth. Um, the other um, uh, project, I'm going to skip through that very fast, but we are trying to basically look into the brain uh, hypoxia, so I'm going to skip that. The other project that I'm going to explain is that we are developing a tomographic system for breast cancer imaging and breast cancer know that's a very important, it's a leading cause of the cancer death in uh, females, unfortunately, and the incidence of mortality is not really decreasing over the, over the past years. And the major modalities in clinic to detect our mammography, B-mode ultrasound and MRI, well, MRI is not recommended while you go uh, as, as a patient, you will not get the MRI at the beginning. You have to go through some exams before you're recommended for MRI. B-mode ultrasound, unfortunately, does not have a specificity in detecting whether the, the lesion is benign or malignant. And X-ray mammography, which is kind of a standard of care for breast cancer screening, have difficulties in dense breast tissue because based on the tissue density and when people with dense breasts usually in the, in the younger population, uh, do the mammogram, they basically, it's, it's kind of hard to catch the lesions. So um, I had the privilege to work with one of the uh, uh, faculty at Wayne State that uh, came from the Cancer Biology Department at Kahn's Carmanos Cancer Institute, and they developed a very nice system, ultrasound tomography system that basically have a ring ultrasound transducer. So there is a ring ultrasound transducer. The patient is lying, the breast is, basically hanging in a water tank. And this ring ultrasound transducer scans the patient, scans the breast, and gets not only the normal pulse echo uh, reflection mode ultrasound images, 
But because now you have a transmission ultrasound, you can get a sound speed or, or sorry, sound speed maps and attenuation maps. And we know that sound speed and attenuation maps are very well reflecting the density of the breast. And they're also able to show with a very high quality the lesions. So what we are trying to add, we are trying to add photoacoustic to it. To major, the major challenge is how to deliver the light. If you deliver the light from the bottom, you will not be able to get close to a chest wall. If you want to try fibers, fibers have a lot of difficulty. So we came up with an idea that we published a couple of papers on it, that we can use mirrors, uh, coaxicone and conical rings, and we can generate a ring on the breast right in front of the ultrasound transducer so that we can do accurate ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. We implemented the system um, in the preclinical mode first, and we showed that we have a very nice penetration depth using this illumination. We get a very good uniform signal, which means that when the light is going from all directions into the object, it's able to basically generate a very uniform signal, very uniform um, uh, very uniform um, um, uh, illumination pattern. And then we also compare this with existing illumination modalities where people try to diffuse or they try to use a single beam from the nipple uh, to illuminate the whole breast. And we showed that we can very well, independent from whether we are close to the chest wall or close to the nipple side, we are able to get very consistent um, uh, for the acoustic signal. So this seemed to be a very uh, neat um, and, and uh, effective um, illumination technique for for the acoustic tomography. The other thing we try to do with this project is that we try to uh, basically uh, use ultrasound tomography data to generate a map of optical properties. So I know, for example, when I do ultrasound tomography, ultrasound tomography very accurately tell me where the skin is, where the fat is, where the fibroglandular is. And I know that each of these have different optical properties. So now I can make a model and I can predict how the light diffuses into the tissue. And in other words, I can have a fluence compensated for the acoustic imaging. And if we are able to do that, which we are close to that, doing that, we can do something that we call it quantitative for the acoustic imaging. So I can tell you exactly what is the concentration of the chromophores in the tissue, not the relative concentration, the absolute concentration, which is very important. For example, if you're using the nanotechnology or nanomedicine, like nanoparticles to deliver the drug. So another product thing we are trying to do with this ring is that we are trying to use the ring to induce uh, mild hypothermia. We try to heat up the tumor to 42 degrees and studies have shown that if you do, if you are able to do such a thing, you are basically able to, um, you're basically able to enhance the chemotherapy that the tumor uptake increases, you can enhance the radiation therapy. So we have shown that we are able with, a, with our ring and with a very safe, low power uh, transmission of the um, LM, tra uh, transmission of the pulses with the um, uh, um, whole ring elements, we are able to generate the localized hypothermia to 42 degrees, which is able to basically enhance the chemo and radiation therapy. All right, so I am very briefly going over this. We developed a very small footprint endoscopic system. Uh, so I'm just showing you, we were able to make a 6.2 millimeter endoscopic system. And that's basically for imaging inaccessible or hard accessible. Um, uh, regions of the body, such as bladder, inside the uterus, and prostate. And then the other procedure that we are doing is that we are trying to use for the acoustic imaging for guiding uh, ablation procedures uh, by, first of all, locating where the ablation catheter is, and then second of all, monitoring the temperature so that the physicians have a temperature feedback, whether there is enough ablation, and they also make sure that they don't ablate the normal tissue. So acknowledgement, I am very lucky to work with a very uh, 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 brilliant uh, team of collaborators. And of course, I have a very good students and staff in my lab. I, a lot of things uh, that I'm uh, doing now is because of the training that I got at University of Texas and Mayo Clinic. So I always have to acknowledge my mentors and uh, my former colleagues. 
And the last slide that I have is uh, basically showing where the lab is located. I told you at the beginning, the unique position that we have at Wayne State to, between the, for, to establish collab collaboration between the College of Engineering and Medical School. And hopefully this map shows you the availability of the facility. So this is where my lab is located. Henry Ford Hospitals is kind of a few blocks away. And then in another few blocks away down uh, to the, um, or sorry, sorry, up north, we basically have a large medical campus that Carmanos Cancer Institute is there. Uh, Detroit Medical Center is there. Hudson Hospital, which is housing the prenatology research branch of NIH is there. Children Hospital is there and the VA med uh, uh, Medical Center. So with that, um, um, I know I went pretty much over time. It's, uh, b b b if you have questions, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer and feel free to uh, email me if you have more questions or if there's anything else that I can provide information about. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. This is great. I, I like the last uh, picture you're showing here. It shows that uh, we have the great you know, facility uh, and uh, you know, potential collaborations here. Right. Okay, so I think uh, time-wise, this is good. I will have, uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions if, if we have uh, from the audience. You can just unmute yourself, go ahead and ask. I went very much over time. <laughs> no, yeah, it's okay. I feel like I can see the enthusiasm come from, you know, from you. Um, um, very interesting. You know, this is the first time I, you know, although we were met together in many meetings, but the first time I get a chance to know what you are working on. Sounds like uh, they do have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, interesting things happening with, uh, you know, even in the computer science, you probably know uh, Dr. Ming Dong there and a couple of other colleagues, they're also working on image processing. Right. And then you are on ultrasound. You know, one of my students who just defended it, she was in the, uh, doing a intern at Harry Ford Health System, is doing prostate uh, cancer re research with the radiology departments. But yeah, they are um, applying machine learning techniques there to do this uh, distributed, feathered the learning on these images. So they, they do have some potential. Maybe you can collaboration in time the road. Absolutely. Actually, machine learning is the next topic that um, I'm, I'm going to um, have some focus in my lab. Um, we are yeah. initiating a couple of machine learning because uh, I believe that the images that we are getting and we already have in clinic, they're, they're, there, there's a lot of hidden information in them that, that we have to extract them. So we don't necessarily need to keep developing new technologies. We have to basically look use, more accurately, right. exactly use the data right. better. So right. we're actually right. launching a couple of uh, uh, machine learning, two machine learning projects in my lab now. Very good, very good. I saw- hey. uh, I had uh, a Naomi. comment, oh, sorry. I had a comment, uh, it was a fascinating presentation. Thank you very much and, and explained very well. You went into a, you know, the nice, a nice uh, level of depth and understanding the technology and then the overall application. So thank you. How, how, how close are we to seeing applications in practice in, for uh, photoacoustics? Right. Uh, very good question. And that's the question that uh, basically the whole uh, communities keep asking. Um, I told you that the first FDA approved machine is already in clinic uh, for, for the breast cancer staging and, and the breast cancer, not, not the screening for breast cancer staging. Um, I think with the number of the clinical trials that we have, um, we'll definitely have something soon for the neonatal brain. We'll definitely have something soon for the skin and uh, a couple of other applications. But I think we are fairly close to have this widely in clinic. Uh, um, the breast cancer was actually a very big news. It was like basically everybody in the community was happy uh, because we don't have too much of a concern about the, um, about the uh, safety of the machine. Just basically going through the FDA uh, procedure uh, to determine how effective the diagnostic parameters that you're extracting from, from, from photoacoustic art. And this is like what, what the route that elasticity, when elasticity is in clinic already, but they also 
were not able to use the, the quantitative values for diagnostic until maybe two, three years ago. And there was a very long path between development of the machines to get the FDA approval. So I think with this device getting an FDA approval for breast cancer, I think soon we are going to see more FDA approved devices in clinic for photoacoustic. Very good. We have one question from uh, Yami. Noemi, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Um, I have one question about one of the last applications uh, about the one of the, um, the preterm uh, burns. Um, how, well, there are several um, causes of preterms. So, I hope I'm not getting into medical field instead of engineering field, but how could this sonography help to prevent the preterm burns um, if there are like a lot of things that could cause um, this like rush in, in yeah, in, in, in the burn. Right. That, that's actually excellent question. And um, I hope that I didn't imply that with this technique, we are going to solve the whole problem of the preterm birth. So uh, we know that the, the, the part of, or a, a, at least a group of patients who have the preterm birth, it happens because of untimely ripening and the funneling of the cervix. And we're only targeting that population. I don't have on top of my head what percentage is that, but I think it's a significant percentage that uh, the, the preterm birth happens because of the, for example, intrauterine infection and that intrauterine infection affects the cervix and causes the cervix to untimely ripe and open. Uh, but of course, there are many other factors like the trauma, uh, different, different, different uh, b -b 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 reasons exist for the preterm birth. So, we are not targeting those. So we are only targeting the patients who undergo preterm birth because of the cervix insufficiencies. And we know that this is a standard routine in the pregnancy monitoring now that the patients get twice of the, uh, they get at least twice uh, ultrasound, um, uh, transvaginal ultrasound of, of the cervix. So our goal is to, basically do more than ultrasound. And if we detect the signs of molecular decomposition or less elasticity in the cervix, basically that rings a bell that this patient is at the risk. So we are not targeting or we are not trying to solve the, all the problem with the preterm birth, only those that are related to the cervical untimely ripening. Thank you. Sure. All right, this is great. Um, okay, I think that uh, we are like seven minutes past the 11. So thank you very much for the nice presentation. And also thank you very much for the audience and your active participation on this. Um, next week, we will have the seventh seminar. Well, actually, I, I will be speaking on that, talking about edge computing and on the connected autonomous vehicle stuff. So I hope that, um, yeah, we, we were sending the, uh, you know, the, the flyers out. Maybe we will draw a very different group of audience here, but uh, thank you very much for your time. Have a nice thank day. You. Thanks, thanks. Take care. Thanks. Sure. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.